Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar, the Incident Command System Planning Cycle. Please note all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the event. We will provide you with instructions on how to ask a verbal question at that time. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. Send in a question. Please select the all, part, all panelist choice on your Send to drop-down menu of the chat panel. The chat panel is located in the lower right-hand side of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a note to the event producer, or you can call the help desk at 888-796-6118. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Clark. Please go ahead, Liz. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Clark with the Special Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to thank you for joining us today for the webinar on the Incident Command System Planning Cycle. Today, our speaker is Lisa Tiro. Lisa has worked for the California Department of Food and Agriculture for 18 years, mostly in an emergency response and preparedness capacity. She has responded to multiple California animal disease emergencies, including 2002 exotic Newcastle disease eradication, 2008, 2011, and 2012 bovine tuberculosis response, 2012 California BSC, and 2014 low pathogenic avian influenza, as well as the 2015 highly pathogenic avian influenza incidents. Ms. Kiros manages a small team of veterinarians and professional staff focused on animal disease outbreak response preparedness. Lisa and her team are responsible for maintaining the roster of California Department and USDA Animal Response Incident Management team members and organizes planning, training, and exercise events. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lisa. Thank you, Liz. And thanks to all of you who have joined today to learn a little bit more about the Incident Command System Planning Team. Um, this course was customized and delivered to our California Animal Health Incident Management Team. That incident management team is comprised of California USDA Veterinary Services personnel as well as the California Department of Food and Agriculture personnel. Um, Today, this um, course is going to describe how our state activates for foreign animal disease outbreaks. We realize that not all states are exactly the same, but we're hoping that you can adapt what I'm presenting here today for what would work for your state. So first off, I just want to explain that there are two modules to this course. Today, we will go through module one, and then at a future date, um, Liz will be sending out an announcement for a future webinar where we will continue the planning process for Module 2. Um, so today, some of the key discussion points are we're going to go through the components of the planning P. Mainly, we're going to focus on the leg of the P. Um, we will talk about small-scale versus large-scale incidents, um, what's needed for initial response and assessment. Um, I want to speak to the value of the ICS Form 201 and we'll talk about initial unified command briefings. And so CDFA and USDA use the incident command system to manage animal health emergency responses. I'm hoping that most of you have already taken the FEMA online courses called ICS 100 and 200. That really provides the basics for what this training is all about. Um, the planning P is a component of the incident command system, and it's a tool that's used to plan and manage an incident response from an incident command post. And it is comprised of two parts, which um, today we're going to focus on the leg of the P. Um, the top part is really the planning cycle, and it's sort of circular and, and it continues. Um, So the planning team was developed to facilitate development of the incident action plan. The incident action plan is compiled and produced uh, by the planning section with input from other sections and units that are assigned to the incident. Um, we're going to discuss the incident action plan in greater detail throughout this course. Um, an incident action plan is really the playbook for the day's operations. Um, really, what do we intend to get accomplished during that day or shift? What resources are we using? How do we communicate with one another? And what do we do in case of injury or if we're contacted by the media? So why do we produce 
an incident action plan? And how do we use it to manage our incident response? So the IAP, Incident Action Plan, is a tool to assist with organizing and informing responders of all incident activities in progress. Um, it really aligns the field activities with the agency administrator's directions, priorities, and constraints. It's the responsibility of the incident commanders to demonstrate how they are meeting the agency administrator's expectations, and producing an incident action plan is one of those ways. The incident action plan disseminates recommendations for mitigating worker safety consideration. It documents safety and li for liability purposes, where our responders are working during any given shift. Um, and as an employer, we must know where our workers are working each operational period, and we need to understand what hazards they have been exposed to. And working through the planning cycle and producing an incident action plan ensures that we know where our responders are in any given shift. The incident action plan also communicates work assignments to resources that are assigned to the incident so that everybody from the top down understands who's assigned to what task, who's responsible for what equipment, and it reduces duplication of efforts in that way. The incident action plan also, over time, looking back through the produced incident action plans, demonstrate progress toward meeting our incident objectives. This is a key incident command system principle, managing the incident by objectives. In our day-to-day -day lives, we usually manage incidents or manage situations by available resources. You have five people, you put those five people to work, and you get the job done whenever it gets done. During an emergency, we don't want to limit ourselves to the amount of resources we currently have on hand. If we have an outbreak of animal disease, <clears throat> speed and timeliness, is of great consequence in these diseases. So we don't want to manage the incident by just what available resources we have on hand. We need to set an objective of what needs to be accomplished that day or that shift, and then we need to order enough resources to get that goal accomplished. And so the incident action plan helps us to define what is it we're trying to get accomplished that shift and what resources are we using to get that done. At the end of that shift, we can look back and say, why didn't we meet our objective? Was it lack of resources? Was it a bad strategy or tactic? And we can make adjustments as we go through the incident in order to, you know, be the best that we can be and, and get after it the best that we can. The incident action plan defines strategies and tactics, as I said, it also can provide some insight into the thought process behind making those decisions, and often the incident action plan is a backup for legal challenges. The incident action plan also describes critical information requirements, like how often do we submit our situation reports, and what kind of key de direct decisions, constraints, priorities has command set as far as direction goes. The incident action plan also incorporates a written communication plan so that all of the people that are assigned to the incident know how to call or get a hold of one another. And the incident action plan also serves as historical documentation. So it's sort of a snapshot in time for our event. Okay, so what triggers an incident for us? So we've narrowed our foreign animal disease response incidents down to these two, I guess we would call them conditions or definitions. So one is if we receive preliminary or confirmed laboratory positive results for a foreign animal disease, we consider that an incident. The second is if we are performing activities in our state, that are related to mitigation of an imminent animal disease or public health threat, and those are such that our state veterinarian or our veterinary services assistant district director activates our California incident management team, we consider that an incident. As we've moved on with our thought process around how to define an incident for ourselves, we came up with these two because when we consider a threat like SMD, if it's, uh, 
if it's detected in another state and not in your own, if it's in the U.S. somewhere or even North America, there may be actions that your state is taking even before you receive a preliminary positive for that foreign animal disease. And so we wanted to be able to activate our incident management team to oversee those types of events. Um, so some people may define their incidents as beginning with the foreign animal disease investigation, and I can see where that works too. Some elements of the routine foreign animal disease investigation do follow the steps on the leg of the P here during initial response. You know, you still do your notifications, you still do your initial response and assessment for those foreign animal disease um, investigations, you complete your epidemiology, you investigate the situation, you do your case documentation, hopefully in EMERS, um, and uh, you know, upon receipt of those negative results, you can close that case, investigations closed, no further action is necessary, and you no longer need to move up the leg of this P anymore because your incident is closed. So I can see where that would work for some, some states. Um, okay, so now let's talk a little bit about receiving laboratory results since that's one of the conditions that activates an incident in our state. So we have a California veterinary diagnostics lab. It's called the California Animal Health and Food Safety Service Laboratory. Um, they are a member of the NOL, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. Every time we do a foreign animal disease investigation in our state, we always take duplicate samples. The original sample is shipped to NBSL, National Veterinary Services Laboratory. The duplicate sample stays here at our local non-laboratory and gets tested simultaneously. So um, when we receive results, often we receive results because our laboratory is closer to us, um, from the California lab, we get some preliminary results. We will wait for national lab confirmation of those presumptive positive results um, before we will actually announce that there is a foreign animal disease detection in our state. We do not wait to respond. We go ahead on preliminary results. We go ahead and gather our incident management team and respond, but we don't make any public announcements. Um, until we know that National Lab has confirmed. Okay, so now, so we said, you know, an incident could be either enhanced preparedness and mitigation activities going on in our state, or an incident begins with some sort of presumptive or, or uh, positive results. Once we in our state get a preliminary positive result from the laboratory, as I said, we activate and begin responding immediately. It's much easier to stand down our, our response if it's a false alarm. It's much harder to get that ball up and rolling. And so we don't wait. We go ahead and get started. Um, and then some enha enhanced preparedness mitigation activities that might go on in your state when you don't have a disease detection, um, like for in the case of FMD, some people may be doing some surveillance in their state, some people may be implementing movement controls, many people would be doing that. So those are the types of activities that we anticipate would require incident management team oversight for an, an incident under definition number two here on this slide. Okay, so moving up the leg of the P here, now we're at notifications. One thing I want to say about notifications is at this stage of the game where we have a preliminary positive and no uh, national lab confirmation, we want to make notifications on a need-to-know basis. So we make notifications, we make plenty of notifications. Um, but notification begins at this stage but it doesn't end here. This is an ongoing activity during the, the initial response phase because of the timing of how we receive those confirmation, uh, the confirmed positive results from national labs. So again, prior to national lab confirmation, notifications are made on a need-to-know basis. We want to keep those notifications discreet until we receive national lab confirmation. We don't want to cause trade bans on a false alarm. 
So we, we keep our notifications discreet. We advise the owners of the animals during the foreign animal disease investigation that they should also be discreet until we know exactly what's going on and can confirm. So um, the way that notification works in our particular um, state is our field veterinarian notifies our headquarters office, our state veterinarian um, receives a call from our, so during a foreign animal disease investigation, our field staff call up to our headquarters office and make our state veterinarian aware that they are investigating a, a suspicious case. Then um, we also communicate with our in-state VS office to obtain a foreign animal disease tracking number so they also are aware that some sort of suspicious case is being um, investigated. In our state, we do share the foreign animal disease investigation work with veterinary services. So some of those are conducted by the state, some of those are conducted by USDA, but we always keep each other in the loop. We, both agencies always know when there is an investigation of a suspect going on in the state. Once we receive those um, preliminary positive results from our laboratory, our state veterinarian gets a, a call from the laboratory to make notification of those results. And at that point, she initiates a conference call with the USDA Veterinary Services Assistant District Director and any appropriate partners. Mainly, this is an internal only call. So we're, um, you know, we notify up our chain executive staff. I know our USDA Veterinary Services um, Assistant Director uh, notifies up their chain, um, but mainly it's just CDFA and USDA that are involved in this response at this time. Okay, so now we're at initial response and assessment. So the period of initial response and assessment occurs during all incidents. I talked to, to you about how this happens during a foreign animal disease investigation as well. Um, during this time, we are gaining situational awareness. So once we have a preliminary positive from the laboratory, we're conducting our initial observations. We may go out and do additional animal examinations, um, depending on how that was done during the previous foreign animal disease investigation and whether or not the owner is uh, reporting additional disease. We may take additional samples. We're definitely interviewing the owner and getting some additional epidemiologic information. We're also evaluating the facility and the premises setup. If we need to depopulate or do some sort of controlled movement on this, per on this premises, we need to understand how the facility is laid out. We also keep in communication with our laboratory for additional sample coordination. At this time, the field veterinarian is probably a one-man or a two-man band, you know, holding this show down. They may or may not have time to develop some initial ob objectives, but they have in their mind the next steps. If they need to amend the quarantine based on the, the uh, presumptive positive that was provided to us, they do that, um, and they have some steps in mind of what needs to happen next. Maybe there's some dangerous contact. Maybe there's some feed truck traces. Maybe there's a rendering truck trace. Um, so there's all kinds of things that are going on in this field veterinarian's head while they're determining what their initial objectives are. Sometimes those get written down, sometimes not. I'm going to speak to the fact that we would like to get those written down, and I'm going to explain how we do that. Um, so if there are additional response personnel, the initial field veterinarian is considered the initial incident commander, and they would be responsible for organizing and directing initial response personnel and tracking any resources. Again, at this stage of the game, we're very early. There may or may not be additional resources involved at this time. What we would ask this field veterinarian to do is to gather information for reports like a situation report or a um, what we call an ICS Form 201, which is an incident briefing form. So again, our, um, our initial 
foreign animal disease diagnostician. They are assessing the situation. What kind of incident is this? Who are my key players so far? When did the incident occur? Where is this incident? Are there any area of responsibility problems? Like, is this on tribal land? Um, are we in some sort of uh, area where we would be on a border where some of this incident might spill over into another state? So we're looking at out that kinds of stuff. Um, we may be thinking about incident organization. Certainly, this foreign animal disease diagnostician cannot handle this incident alone, so they would request their incident management team. And they may also be requesting equipment, like maybe foamers or 3D contractors or whatever it takes, um, whatever they can see initially might be a need. Maybe they don't see that need right away and they don't get those ordered, but we're, we're trying to encourage our folks to order things sooner rather than later. It's better to get things rolling, get, get the resources moving. Also, we ask our staff to be thinking about the next meeting or briefing. What new information do you have that needs to be shared on with the next uh, people, especially the incident management team? So when we activate an incident management team, there's lots of conference calls that go on during that initial response and assessment. When we get that preliminary positive from the lab, we do an initial conference call between our state veterinarian, our USDA uh, VS assistant director, our, uh, our veterinary diagnostic lab, our field veterinarians, several of us get on a conference call and we really kind of get from the laboratory, what are they seeing? From the field, what are they seeing? What do they know about the incident so far? What, is, what have they already found um, epidemiologically so that we can start understanding the parameters of this event and how big or small it might be? By the time we get to requesting an incident management team, which often happens during those conference calls, it takes, a, you know, a little bit for our incident management team to get there, sometimes just a few hours. Um, it might take six hours for someone to arrive. Within our state, we can probably pretty much get anywhere within six to eight hours. So um, we generally activate our incident management team and deploy those personnel immediately. Um, and we conduct this incident briefing. What this incident briefing is, is the, um, the initial foreign animal disease diagnostician has collected all of this information, either on their um, EPI report of this foreign animal disease investigation. Um, we're asking our veterinarians to collect this information and document it on an ICS-201 form. And then we want them to use that tool one form to brief the incoming incident management team. Um, this time frame of the, inc the incident brief is usually when we transition the incident over from that initial veterinarian, which we consider the initial incident commander, let's say, over to the leadership of the incident management team. I would not consider this a true, what we would call, transfer of command in the ICS sense of the word because not all the documentation has happened yet for that, but we are definitely transitioning the incident to a larger team who can manage more and take on more. The initial field vet often stays on in the incident and plays a role. They may be the ops chief, they may turn into the incident commander, they might be the case manager, whatever that may be, that initial field vet has critical information about this premises and the initial um, part of the response. So we don't want to just push that person aside. We, we want to integrate them into the incident, and we do. So. Um, so really, in this stage, we like to pair our 201 briefing for the incident management team with our agency administrator briefing. Um, and so the agency administrator briefing really becomes the new incoming incident management team's marching orders. And this is also, also the time where we issue a delegation of authority to that incoming incident commander or incident management team. Um, and again, I said the that 
the, the initial incident commander or that foreign animal disease diagnostician is responsible for briefing the responders that are coming in using that um, ICS Form 201. That 201 form serves as the initial incident action plan for that first operational period when we're first start starting initial response. So I stole this from the U.S. Coast Guard. They, like us, begin their responses immediately with state, federal, unified command organization. They have a lot of industry input into their oil spills. Um, you know, they have a responsible party on the ship, owner, and so they have a lot of private, um, private industry. Um, and so their response and a lot of their ICS organization is very applicable, can be borrowed from very easily for a foreign animal disease response. And I really like their materials. They're very practical. I would recommend their materials to anyone who wants to learn more about this. So this incident briefing layout just kind of shows what I was talking about before, which is the current incident commander there in the blue circle is the foreign animal disease diagnostician, the initial incident commander, and then the unified command in the white chairs over there, that is the incoming incident management team. So the goal here of this briefing is that the initial incident commander provides a briefing for the incident management team as they're coming in to the, the incident. If you have other uh, staff that was part of the initial response, like a planning section chief or a documentation person, we would encourage those folks to also be part of this incident briefing. You don't always have other staff, though, right? When you're the foreign animal disease diagnostician, and sometimes you're it. And so um, we would just try to get this person to share as much information during this briefing as they possibly can. Again, I mentioned that this is the time where we would want to integrate the state veterinarian and the USDA Veterinary Services um, Assistant Director, District Director, to um, provide an agency administrator briefing during this time. So this incoming Unified Command Incident Management Team is receiving both information from the original field vet, the uh, initial incident commander, and they're also receiving priorities, constraints from the state veterinarian and the USDA VS assistant district director. Okay, so at the incident briefing, we use uh, three documents. Ground rules are always used at each uh, meeting. There's always an agenda for the incident command system meetings, and we use the ICS Form 201. So I'm going to go into those a little bit um, into more detail. All ICS planning meetings that go around the P should have an agenda and a facilitator assigned. Um, each of those meetings has a specific purpose. I know that we all, especially at the beginning of an incident, there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot going on. We get tempted to use these meetings for whatever we want to talk about, um, but I would caution anyone who's, who's doing this planning cycle to keep the planning team meetings for what they are for. The purpose of those meetings is there's a purpose for those meetings. If you need to schedule another meeting to address other concerns, I would highly recommend scheduling a separate meeting. Um, if the planning cycle meetings start to get too long and off topic, people are going to start not wanting to go to them because there will be no purpose to the meeting anymore. And then that's when we get some people complaining about how ICS doesn't work for us. And it's normally because we aren't using it properly. So getting off topic on those meetings, it's a good way to lose focus. And I believe that's on the path of, path of losing command and control of your incident. I would highly recommend keep these meetings for what they're for. Okay, so ground rules. These are easy peasy. Everybody knows these ground rules. Turn off your cell phone, be on time, stay on topic, use a parking lot, follow the directions of the facilitator, no side conversations if you need to take a phone call, step outside, et cetera, et cetera. So those are easy peasy. Everyone should follow the ground rules. When you're working 18-hour days, seven days straight for weeks on end, Somebody being late for a meeting, it just it just gets irritating. It's a it's a waste of everybody's time, and it's disrespectful. So we try to um, set some ground rules and, and maintain those. The person who comes in late buys donuts. 
Um, okay, so this is the incident briefing agenda. This is the agenda we use. I pulled this directly out of Coast Guard again. Um, the 201 form outlines the current situation, and so it talks about the territory. Sometimes it includes an overhead map. Sometimes it's a hand-drawn map of where the barns are on the premises, et cetera. Um, it may talk about safety concerns. It will talk about any facilities that have already been established, like if you've already set up a PPE station on that premises, we would want to know where that is. If you've already set up an incident command system, an incident command post somewhere, we want to know where that is. Um, we'll also outline initial objectives and priorities. So if this foreign animal disease diagnostician has already identified that there are some priority traces that need to be followed up on, this is the time that they would share that information. Uh, current and planned actions, so if you have already taken some current actions, like issued a quarantine, you know, uh, taken additional samples, you know, whatever, those actions need to be documented somewhere because we will need to wrap that information into a situation report to be able to report on our progress throughout this incident. So I would highly recommend that that initial foreign animal disease diagnostician, if they are too busy, that they get on the phone with somebody who can help them document these actions. Um, current on-scene organization, if you have activated any staff, it's important to share who's already on scene. Methods of communication, if you're using walkie-talkies or, you know, whatever, it's important for you to, for the incoming incident management team to understand what communication methods you're already using, any resources assignments, any resources you've already ordered or might be en route. Um, if you already have an understanding of the potential incident complexity, like this owner happens to share employees with, you know, four other locations, that's good information to share. That's going to help us understand how this could potentially scale up in complexity. And we also need to know what notifications have been completed at that time. Um, the words here, transfer of command, again, this is not a true transfer of command. It's really, this is the transition of this initial incident from that initial foreign animal disease diagnostician to that incoming incident management team who will receive a delegation of authority from the state veterinarian. And um, I don't know. Everybody is at a different place on delegation of authority. In our state, we do have a written delegation of authority that's given from our state veterinarian to our assigned incident commander. Um, so the incident briefing form, it's actually in different parts, right? So it's a documentation of the current situation, the current objectives, like what, have you, what are you currently working on or what's, what's already been accomplished, your planned actions, and then any resources that are already assigned or that you've ordered. And again, this 201 form serves as our initial incident action plan just for that very first operational period. We will produce formal incident action plans for future operational periods. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the ICS-201 form. This is an, uh, just a little snapshot of the 201 form that we developed for our animal health incidents. Um, you can see there that it has the incident name or the FAD investigation number, who it's prepared by. We have what we call um, veterinarians in, veterinarian in charge in our field offices, and so we want to make sure that the um, foreign animal disease diagnostician has had his 201, his or her 201, reviewed by that veterinarian in charge. Um, we want to get GPS coordinates if possible. This is essential immediately for mapping. Um, you wouldn't be surprised how often we get, just by trying to Google search the address, how often we get the wrong location. So getting the GPS coordinates immediately while you're on that um, premises is a good idea. Um, in the current situation here, like this is like a next page, so the map page behind there, this number four here, current situation, this is like the next page of this form. We try to have the uh, foreign animal disease diagnostician collect the uh, premises location information, the, you know, their regular address, 
if they have a national PREM ID, we would like to know that. We want to know the affected species. Are there multiple species on the premises? Do they have a census? We want to know what they submitted their uh, samples for the, uh, the disease differential. We want to know the reason the original samples were taken. Was this routine surveillance? Was it a slaughter trace? Did they get a sick call? You know, why, why did we receive the, or why did we take the samples in the first place? Um, who's our point of contact? And then we want to know, have they already visited the farm? In most cases, the answer to this is yes. Um, and we want to also, especially with a zoonotic disease, we want to know if the owner or employees have been reporting any human signs of illness. We also want to discuss confidentiality with the owner. You would be surprised how many people post on social media about their quarantine or whatever. So we want to advise that they not do that. And then we also want to be watchful and mindful if there's any media or group activity that are observed near the farm. And we want to make sure that somebody has um, shared that information with the incoming team. Okay, so completing the form, again, what's needed to complete the form, this is all the stuff that our foreign animal disease diagnosticians would normally um, normally capture during their normal investigation. What are the presenting clinical signs? What were the sample submission and the reason? The differential testing requested? Uh, affected species? Potential human health risks? Uh, flock or herd demographics? We want to know mor morbidity and mortality. Mor mortality um, if they know the uh, ratios there. We want to know also about the premises. We want to understand the layout of the premises, and we want to understand what biosecurity measures have been put in place. Our foreign animal disease diagnostician is responsible for sharing with that owner the enhanced biosecurity measures that must be in place upon uh, quarantine there. We also want to take note of lab results if we have the pathogen, the subtype, the pathogenicity, gene sequencing. Um, as the incident progresses, we will get more and more information from the lab about what the uh, disease is. And so we want to continue to capture that information as it comes out. Some of the information will be available and can be put into this ICS-201 form. Other parts of that information will have to wait until a formal situation report is developed, you know, in a day or two. Okay. So in our uh, state, we have discussions about who should draft this ICS-201 form. Who has the most, most knowledge of the incident or the situation? That's who should draft the form. In the event that the FADD, Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostician, is busy because they are instituting a quarantine on the premises, they are helping set up biosecurity, they are doing other things, we have made um, recommendations that that person use another person, a livestock inspector, an animal health technician, someone back at the office who can help them document the situation. So maybe they can gather information on, over the phone from that person so that we can start the incident documentation early on while it's fresh in everyone's mind. Um, let's see. Our ICS Form 201 is reviewed by our agency administrator, so we allow our state veterinarian is our agency administrator on the state side, and we consider our USDA BS Assistant Director to be the agency administrator on the USDA side. Um, and so we would allow them to review this 201 form before it's further distributed. Okay, so, I know I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to say it. Be professional. These forms could be available for public scrutiny, especially if there's a lawsuit later on, down many months later. So we don't want to we don't want to say anything that's not professional. We can be truthful and honest. It's okay to say the owner was uncooperative, but we don't want to say the owner was a jerk. Um, okay. So ICS-201 form, 
Once it's approved, we share that form. Um, obviously, it goes to the incoming IMT, as we talked about during the briefing. Um, we want that IMT to use that 201 form and the initial information to develop their initial situation report. It's also used by logistics and by the resources unit in planning to help track resources and the resources orders that have already um, kind of been in play or in the system. And so um, that initial 201 form really provides a leg up to that incoming incident management team to be able to start their needed documentation for the incident. Okay, so now we're at the, I would say, the last meeting in the initial response phase, and this is called the initial unified command meeting. Um, in, our, in our organization, this is where our state and our USDA incident commanders would meet to agree on incident priorities, key decisions, resolve conflicts that are related to their incident, you know, their delegations of authority. And um, they would, you know, make agreement on key decisions. During this event, during this meeting, you don't want to have everybody on your incident management team present. Mainly, those people need to be working on the incident and getting themselves organized, their incident command post set up, et cetera. You have a couple of people in this incident, which is good. You want to bring in a situation unit leader. If you have a situation unit leader and you have a report to give of new information, you want to bring that person in, have them give their report, then they can leave. The planning section chief can facilitate this meeting if you want them to. Um, documentation, it's always good to have somebody in your meeting who is documenting the decisions that you're making. Okay, so really quickly, let's talk about the delegation of authority. In our state, the delegation of authority is really the process of granting authority to carry out specific functions to the incident commander. The delegation of authority grants the authority to carry out um, the disease response functions, the ones that we all know about, you know, depopulation, disposal, C and D, surveillance, you know, all the major functions. Um, it also establishes agency priorities and expectations. If the state veterinarian wants to be briefed at a certain time every day or at least briefed daily, that's an expectation that can be outlined in the delegation of authority. And it also documents any constraints, like we're not using vaccination right now or whatever. Um, so a delegation of authority is issued by the chief elected official or the chief executive officer. Um, or on our case, it's, it's uh, issued by our agency administrator, who is our state veterinarian. Um, these delegations can be in writing or verbally. Um, we do ours in writing. And it really allows the incident commander to assume command, knowing that they have the authority to carry out all of the functions that are necessary. The delegation of authority does not relieve the granting authority from the ultimate responsibility for the incident. Um, whether this delegation of authority is granted in writing or verbally, um, the authorities granted remain with that incident commander until such time as the incident is terminated or the incident commander is relieved of his shift, you know, like just for rest, or the incident commander is relieved from his duties for just cause. Um, so. Okay, so key decisions. What kind of key decisions are discussed during this initial unified command meeting? Um, they, they're documented decisions like where are our jurisdictional boundaries, right? So in our state, if it jumps over to Oregon, you know, California people are not going to have jurisdictional authority in Oregon. So then the Oregon needs to handle, you know, jurisdictional authority over there. And, or if this jumps into a tribal area, how does that change jurisdictional authorities and boundaries? And so we talk about area of responsibilities and where everybody can and cannot operate. Um, we talk about and set a name for this incident. It's important for EMERS, it's important for documentation, it's important for tracking all the way up to the national level that our incident have a unique name. And so we discuss and set a name for this incident early on. Um, we discuss the overall response organization and we make sure that we have the appropriate positions activated. 
Uh, the unified commander should be determining the location of their incident command post if they haven't already, and any additional facilities like staging areas or any other support um, facilities that may need to be established. They will set an operational period length, and they will set start time and work shift needs. You know, they may talk about work rest periods. They may talk about, uh, you know, whether or not they're going to do night operations. Um, and then they also agree on their command and general staff and technical support that might be needed. So they agree who's going to be our ops chief, who's going to be our planning chief, et cetera. If the IMT has already been deployed together, often they already have a command and general staff in place. If they're all comfortable with that, they can just go with that. But if they haven't, if they, the two incident commanders were just deployed and then they're trying to put their team together, then they might want to have a discussion at this point on what that means to put their team together. Um, so we like to document these key decisions on a form called the 202A. I borrowed that form from the Coast Guard. It's a very good form. It's called a, a key decision form. That form is, I can't tell you how many times during an incident we go over and over and over again, the same issue gets talked about at every meeting because nobody bothered to write it down. Once we put it in writing and we publish it somewhere, then it can kind of be like out of the brain and everybody can feel comfortable, okay, that decision was made, it's posted somewhere. Now they don't have to talk about it anymore. If you don't document your key decisions, I guarantee you they're going to continue to come up and be rehashed. So also during this meeting, we uh, have our unified commanders determine which agencies or technical experts or other agencies that might be required and try to request additional agency participation as needed. We want to clarify unified command roles and responsibilities. If, if our state people are going to take care of a certain role and USDA is going to take care of a certain role, this would be the time for us to to clarify that. You know, maybe one unified commander is going to be the spokesperson for for both incident commanders. So they're speaking with one voice, you know, that kind of thing. And then these two uh, incident commanders would be getting ready for their objectives meeting. Okay. So one thing that happens when you when you transition out of initial response and into the planning cycle part, the top part of the P, um, we we call that then the meetings start becoming uh, cyclical. Um, so you climb that leg of the P once during the incident, and then starting with this green unified ob command objectives meeting, then the the process becomes cyclical. Um, and for, for this particular module, we're done, and I'd like to take questions now. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a verbal question, please simply press pound 2, that's pound 2, on your telephone keypad to enter the verbal question queue. You will hear a notification once your line has been unmuted. At that time, you can state your name and ask your question. As a reminder, to send in written questions, please use the chat panel located in the bottom right-hand side of your screen and choose all panelists to the, on the send to drop-down menu. Right now, we do have one written question, Lisa. Um, it's regarding point two on slide 1-8 that stated the state veterinarian or the USDA vet services AB activates the California incident management team. So they asked, that seems to indicate that USDA VSAD could activate the California IMT. I mean, does the USDA VSAD have that authority? Yeah, our, um, our state veterinarian and our USDA VSAD, they work together simultaneously to make these decisions about activating that incident management team. Um, because it's made up of both VS personnel and California state personnel, either of them can activate the team. They both have vested members on the team, and so either of them could. Generally, they don't make a singular decision like that. They generally consult with one another and make that decision together. Okay, we do have another written question. 
Um, and that is, can you make available your modified ICS-201 form? Yes, I can share that. Liz, can I send that to you and? Send it to me, yep. Okay. Yep, and I can get it out to folks. Happy to do that. And I have another question. Um, can you please put the picture of the planning P up again? Sure. Let's see if I can find that. There you go. And we do have a question waiting on the phone lines. I will go ahead and unmute that line. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Wendy Hall from SIA. Um, this is my question. You mentioned a few times that in, in your state, this is how things go. Um, and I'm wondering how much variability is there across states in terms of the process? And are there certain parts of the process that are more likely to be variable than others? Um, I believe that the concept of how the incident command system is implemented is pretty pretty solid, um, but I believe that there are variances to the way that we activate in California because we have a different number and level of resources in California than other state departments of agriculture might have or animal health organizations might have. So um, they may not have, you know, field offices with multiple employees in their field offices located throughout their state like we do. So um, we have we tend to be able to be more engaged in that initial response because we have more resources. And so I can see where there would be variances to this with other states. To be honest, because I work for my state, I have not responded in another state to their emergencies. I don't, I have not seen firsthand the, the variety of how this is implemented in other states. Um, I'm sure that there's other on national IMT and other states that could speak to that way better than I can. Thank you. Okay, we do have another written question, which I can actually answer. Um, this presentation has been recorded. Um, it, it will be on the Vet Services Training and Exercise Plan page on APHIS VF um, site. But I will send out a notice to um, VSL and to all the states, letting them know that this webinar is now up to date and is on that website for uh, people to view. And the second question is for you, Lisa. It says, besides the 201, are there other CBFA specific modified for FDA ICS forms? Um, you know, we try to stay pretty true to the original ICS forms. We tend to lean towards the Coast Guard forms. I like their forms best. I feel like they have a really good practical field level implementation of incident command. Um, system. Uh, FEMA also has a very good ICS forms booklet, um, but I, we do tend to lean towards the Coast Guard forms. Um, also because I have those in Word documents and they're much easier to edit um, when they're like that and, you know, Excel or whatever, some native format rather than PDF. <laughs> we have not done... I'm sorry. We, I'm sorry. I just, uh, just to finish, we have not done a whole lot of editing of the forms. We edited the 201 form because we wanted specific information reported out to our incoming incident management team. But after that, we pretty much use standard forms. Okay. The next question is, how simple or complex is your written delegation of authority? Um, I can actually share that delegation of authority with you, Liz, and you can post that somewhere or get it out to people who okay. are interested in reading it. Um, uh, what we've done with our delegation of authority is we have combined authorities that are actually in code and reg for um, our state veterinarians, authorities for setting quarantine or uh, destroying animals, seizure of property, et cetera, et cetera. So we have those authorities outlined. And then we have a checklist of expectations, priorities um, that the state veterinarian can or cannot designate 
so that when my state veterinarian goes through this delegation for this particular incident, she reads through it and checks off, yes, I want them to use vaccine or no, I don't want them to. Yes, I want them to conduct statewide surveillance or no, only in the you know control area or the surveillance zone. So it's, there's a lot of uh, options that are listed in our delegation of authority that she's allowed to kind of select at will and decide which of those are appropriate for this incident. Um, I'll share it so that you guys can see more about what that looks like. It's pretty comprehensive okay. in my opinion. And we do have another question. It says, any tips for getting everyone to sit down and commit to going through the planning tea in the midst of an outbreak? In particular, if I just lost the question, it just went up too far, hold on one second. In particular, how do you encourage folks to document the required information and process in writing? Well, um, when we respond to one of these events, so, so some of these lessons are hard learned, right? When we have gone through these events in past where we actually have outbreak response, um, we, we know that taking a minute to organize ourselves and really set objectives and really think through decision making about what's the name of this incident and what are the areas that are going to be impacted and taking that step back to sit through these meetings helps us gain time on the end. We've learned that through trial and error. We've learned that the hard way. Um, we've also learned that not having documentation causes great headache at the back end. Three months later, when Mexico wants to open trade and they ask you, when did that premises enhance biosecurity and you didn't document that fact, now you have a problem because you didn't document it somewhere. So um, because we've learned lessons throughout responding to various multiple in events, we have the support of our executives here that really mandate that these incidents be documented in this way. We have our, our animal health branch chief sends out a note to all of our foreign animal disease diagnosticians that says, when you have an FAD investigation and you get a preliminary positive, you will fill out this 201 form. And they can use their, their already, you know, because they're already going to write up their investigation in a report anyway. So they can use that investigation report and, and attach it. But they also need to fill out the rest of the information that the 201 requires. So I would say we, we, we've learned to do this because we've needed to, because we've been caught before where we have not been prepared. And we've learned that sitting down and organizing ourselves and going through the planning P is what gains time on the end. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question over your phone line, simply press pound two, that's pound two on your telephone keypad you will hear a notification once your line has been unmuted. I do have another written question. It says, I understand that the 201 is used as your initial IAP. How complex does the IAP become with multiple premises involved, perhaps 30 plus, maps, on-scene organizations, et cetera? Yeah, the IAP will start to get, the, the larger your incident is, the larger your IAP is going to be for sure. Um, the major part of the incident action plan that grows is the 204 form. During the next module of the um, this planning P, we're going to go over building that incident action plan and all the forms that go into that. The 204 form is the operational assignment list. And that is the actual tactics that are being carried out during that operational period. As your incident becomes more complex and you have more um, infected premises, you have more field and tactical activities that are going on, and so you have multiple pages and pages and pages of those 204. So that's the major area where your incident action plan grows. Okay. At this time, we're reaching the top of the hour. Um, I don't have any more written questions, and I don't think there's any in the verbal queue. No, we do not have anyone waiting in the verbal queue. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Really appreciate you uh, spending the hour with me.
Yes, and I'd like to thank you also. I just want to let you know, everybody know, our next webinar is on April 3rd. Jose Erdez will be presenting the new BSE sampling requirements. And then we have two more webinars on April 5th. One is at 11 a.m. with Joelle Hayden from LPA on Federal Communication Plans. And at 1 p.m. on April 5th, Lisa Brown and Dr. Fred Bourgeois will be presenting an Ordering Federal Equipment and Supplies webinar during an incident. And we also have additional webinars coming up in April and May, so please be sure to watch your emails. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone and tell everyone have a great day. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to our speakers, and thank you so much for everyone in our audience for joining us today. The session has concluded, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>